In this video, we are going to be recreating this fox in the forest. We're going to be using compositional strategies, including an angled composition, the rule of thirds, and we're going to be breaking the box, or having things extend past the edge of the page. We're going to start by setting things up with the rule of thirds. I'm going to use a guess and check measuring technique to try to Guess what is about one third of the way. You see, I'm spacing my fingers out at what I guess is about one third of the paper, and I'm checking. If my measurement or my guess was wrong, I could readjust. But you see, I'm using the same measurement from the bottom on the top. If I'm correct, my measurement will fit three times in the length of the page, which it seems to fit about right. I mark the top and bottom, and I just briefly draw lines to connect those dots. I'm gonna do the same thing, and you notice here, my first guess was the wrong size, so I had to adjust it a little bit. I'm gonna do the same thing on the opposite side of the page. So I started on the left-hand side, and marked one-third and two-thirds from the bottom. I do the same thing on the right-hand side, and I connect the dots. Notice this is not super perfect and exact. It's an approximation. Once I have that laid out, I'm going to start adding in other elements to this composition. I want my tree to start at the low intersection of two of the lines for the rule of thirds. So I'm going to start with a line that goes diagonally, connecting from that spot, and heading at a gentle angle to about one third or one quarter of the way up the line in the middle section on the opposite edge. Then I'm going to use a branching Y type tree pattern. We know that trees have branches. We know that each branch gets thinner as it goes further and further away from the trunk of the tree. So we're going to make a bunch of Ys on our trees or individual branches that all have slightly different angles and that get thinner as they head away from the trunk. Now I'm going to draw a rock beneath the tree. Notice that the rock is an organic shape with sort of strange angles, but it has a lot of corners. It is not soft and round. It is hard and angular. I'm going to make a little, uh, a little hole or cavity beneath the tree. I'm just kind of drawing a line where I can make the fox kids go. I'm going to draw my horizon line, and unlike normal, I'm making the horizon line here have an angle to it. This whole composition is going to use angles. It's going to create more energy and dynamic interest. So I have this in the top third of my page, and it divides that top third, even breaking into the middle section over at the far right. And we know the horizon is where the sky and ground meet. You know that things get appear smaller as they're close to the horizon. So we're going to draw some trees in the back of this forest. But I want you to notice, one, these are branching trees where the trunk is thick, the branches are thinner, and each branch branches into multiple pieces. Each piece gets thinner than the piece that it came from. I want to have some trees that are pretty close to us, so they start more toward the middle of the page vertically. And I want some that seem far away. Those will be a little bit thinner, and they're going to start a little bit higher up on the page, closer to the actual horizon line. I want to put at least five or six trees in here. Notice our trees should always grow approximately vertically from the angle of our horizon. So all of these trees are growing straight up when I have my paper tilted. I've turned my paper so that the horizon line is straight across, or feels straight across to me. An angled composition is going to make, is going to be one where we make sure that the angles that we use in our image all sort of connect or correspond. They feel right together. So I'm going to make sure that I have a few trees, some that are a little thinner, a little bit de less detailed, some that are a little thicker, 
so a little lower. That's probably all the layout that I really need to do. So here I'm putting the last trees into the picture, making sure they have multiple branches, that each branch gets thinner than the branch that it started from. using that Y-shaped branch method. And now we're going to start drawing the actual fox. And when we look at the fox in the original drawing, we see that the head, not including the ears, is about one third of the whole height of the body. Now I want the head to be centered on the intersection of this line, maybe a little bit beneath it. So I'm going to isolate those three sections. I want the fox to take up the full center section oriented on the left hand third line. So I divide that space into three even boxes the top one will be for the fox head. And notice the fox's head is basically uh, a lot like, it has a big long flat on the bottom. The ears come off from about 45 degree angles. There are vertical or upward pointing sides beneath where the ears come out. And there's a flat in the middle of the head. So, I'm going to make kind of a home run or a home plate shape with a little bit of a flat on top. The ear is a big triangle that adds significantly to the height, but the tip is only slightly past the edge of the head that we've already decided. Both of those ears should have similar shapes. And we have the snout. The snout comes out of the face just slightly. It is approximately rectangular in shape. I see that the space from the edge of the fox's face to the edge of the, to where the snout begins is about one quarter of the fox's face width. So I marked that out. And then I also noticed there's a little bit of an angle so I use rough or approximate shapes to figure out the size and space that the head should start at. But then I'm going to make some adjustments. And I see that the side of the snout has a bit of a curve, and the eye will go around there. It comes out to basically a rectangular sort of form. The front of the rectangle extends past the bottom of the head that we've already started. <laughs> I'm going to gently figure out where the eye should be. Seems to me that the eye should be about half the height, right in the middle, vertically, of that head. We want an eye shape with points in both corners, and it should follow or be similar of an angle to the angle of the head. Here I'm just adding a little bit of fluff on the side of the face to give it a little bit more of a foxy sort of texture. Now I wasn't satisfied with my line in that one. I think it needs a different angle. And so here I'm making sure to draw a little bit of a curve on the edge of the fox's snout. And here's the bottom of the fox's chin, we might say. And I notice that this line starts right slightly beneath the snout. So the lower part of the jaw is slightly smaller than the upper part of the jaw. So there's a little bit of a curve there. And the angle is slightly flatter than that we have for the rest of the snout. And now toward the front, 
And the angle on this is pretty important. I have the front of the mouth where the two jaws meet going at about a horizontal angle. But then I have a corner. And the side where the mouth, where, where the two jaws meet on the side heads upward at the same angle that the rest of the snout is following. So we're really trying to think of the snout as a rectangular prism or a, sh a three-dimensional shape that exudes or comes out of the plane or the flat area of the face. So here I am double checking that my eyes are about the right height, which I feel pretty good about. They're about the middle. And each eye should be about one quarter of the whole width of the fox's face. I'm just darkening these up right now, trying to make sure that we can see them really clearly. Adding a little bit extra on the side of the cheek. <clears throat> and now the tip of the nose, which we only see on the front, the small front side of the snout. And here I'm just doing a little bit of texture and shading. Notice the shading marks that I make are slightly curved. They follow the roundness of the snout. The snout is going to look pretty weird if we don't use some value to show where to define the different sides. We remember that value is a way of indicating where light is hitting things. And most of the time in nature, light is hitting from the top. Now I'm trying to mark in where the color is going to be and where the white spaces in the face are going to be. The fox has a fair amount of white fur. And now I'm on the body. See, the body extends slightly past the edge of the face, but then it has a pretty sharp angle inward. One third of the height of this should be the head, as we discussed earlier. One third should be the torso, and another third should be about legs. Now, I'm going to figure out how long the body should be, too. It looks like it's about three head widths wide. I also notice that the tail is slightly shorter than the whole body. So I'm going to define the edges of the fox now. So I found the very furthest back it should go, about two head widths behind the edge of the head. I see that the tallest part of the back of the fox is lined up about a third of the way up the vertical side of the face. It's where the cheek should have an inner, an angle that heads inward toward the jaw. And it's basically a flat back with a little bit of a curvature down on the front. On the front part of the fox, for his chest, we see that there's a curve, a slight curve outward, but then a pretty sharp curve inward. And that curve ends up right beneath the middle of the snout, or the edge of the front of the snout. And that brings us to a vertical downward line, which is for the leg. This is the leg that's near us. I think at this stage, I have it slightly smaller than I want it to be, so you can see that I'm adding a little height to it. The back of the leg, it gets slightly thicker as it heads up toward the fox's body. And I see that the back rear leg is about as wide as the head or about one third of the width of the body. So I'm marking that out and I see that it starts with a curve gently coming toward the front leg at the back. That curve inverts for a little straight line. And then we have a little bit of a bump for a foot. I see that coming out of the foot, the leg forms pretty soft lines that end up curving up 
and toward the center of the fox's body. And then I'm going to go in and I'm going to add the back leg, the, the leg on the back side of the fox that is mostly hidden or overlapped from us. So we don't need to add a huge amount. And then coming directly beneath the leftmost eye, we want to see the back front leg or the further away front leg. Again, that's going to match the shape of the front leg that we already drew. And then I'm going to add in a line that kind of raggedly curves around the fox's chest. The fox should be white on its front and orange at its back. Now I remember checking my tail length, and it should be nearly as long as the whole body, from the fox's behind all the way past its snout. So I'm going to double check that length. I'm going to measure that with my finger right there. And I'm going to just draw basically a finger. Except it gets slightly skinnier as it attaches to the fox. Now notice the white spot on the top of the fox's tail has a curve. And that line should curve away from the point on the end of the fox's tail. That's what's going to create a three-dimensional effect. Now beneath the fox, I'm going to draw a few sets of eyes. That'd be cute to have some fox kits in this picture. Now I'm going to draw one little fox pup. And when I draw it, I'm going to start. Well, I'm going to make the shape a lot like we made the face. So we're going to start with a little oval for the tip of the nose and a snout coming off of it. Surround that with a sort of round cornered pentagon or home base shape. A couple of little round cornered triangles coming off of that. And then coming out at angles beneath the chin or beneath the, the cheeks of the fox are a couple of small ovals. Those ovals are to represent the fox's feet and limbs. We're going to color those in later so they look more clear. I have a little bit of a tiny little fox tail coming out the back as well. I want this fox to look very cute and floppy like a little baby. And now I feel like I'm about done drawing. Except that I don't love the angle on that back leg. I think it needs to be a little bit more pronounced. So I come back in and I'm going to adjust that. Making some finishing touches. Feeling like the top of the front leg should be a little thinner. And the belly maybe should be a little rounder. Now I'm going to start coloring things in. And I'm going to color using a good medium brown, just a regular brown color. I'm going to use a light pressure layer, although I might use some of the corner or a point of the pencil to draw some lines for the edge of the trees. Notice I'm using vertical long strokes. This creates the illusion or reinforces the texture of tree bark. So I want to make sure to be using these long strokes that tend to overlap each other. And I'm going to fill in the space of the tree. I'm going to do that with all of them. I'm starting fairly light. And remember, some of these trees are farther away than others. The further things are, the more they should have lower detail, lower contrast. So I'm doing a really light coloring job on the farther away trees, and I'm doing a blend with some heavier pressure lines and a fill effect using light pressure for the trees that are a little closer. We can see greater detail in this one because I am lining things with the point of my pencil but I'm also going to go back and fill those in. Now notice 
I'm not filling them all with a heavy pressure. I'm just using heavy pressure to define the edges of things. Generally, it's a good idea to work on things that are far away and then work on things that get closer and closer to the viewer. So I'm starting with the trees, then I'm going to do and do a light pressure layer on the sort of area between the trees of pure background. I like to do the trees before we do that because that background area is going to be sort of hazy or uh, muddy a little bit, and having the trees well-defined makes it easier for me to see what needs to go where. Notice that as the roots leave the tree, or as they come out around the trunk, the angle or curve that they take on should head in different directions. This last one is a tree that's fairly far away from us. Now I'm going to use a dark green, whoops, got that wrong. Here I'm using just a regular gray, and I'm putting a light pressure layer in and around the trees. I don't mind if I color over the tree branches, but I'm trying not to color over the tree trunks themselves. I'm trying to put a light pressure layer in the very background. We're going to mix two or three other colors in this section overall. But this lets us have a good start and a good base for this effect. So I have my pencil tilted at a very shallow angle, nearly flat to the page. I'm coloring with a very wide section of my pencil pigment section. And I'm trying to color so that I don't have lines or significant marks, but I just have a base tone on the whole section in between every tree. After that, I'm going to take a green, probably a dark green or a pine green colored pencil, and I'm going to put in one color of a scumble texture. We know that the forest floor is often a combination of fallen leaves and small plants and shrubs and other random detritus. So we're going to use a texture that creates an organic but random effect. So I'm using scumbling making small circular scribble marks that cover the whole space. Something to notice, I'm going to try to make my circles smaller and tighter as they get further and further up the page. This is going to create an effect that makes the scumbling feel natural and organic as though we're looking in a deep and realistic sort of space. I'm going to try and come up right in between the tree or roots that I already drew because that is the way of the natural world. So you can see that I'm filling that whole area with my smaller and smaller scumbling texture. We're going to go back in here with two or three other colors later. So make sure to leave some space in between your marks. You want to allow all of the colors to show through. And I'm going to do this on the whole background, everything behind the tree and beneath that tilted horizon line.
as I'm finishing up with my scumbling texture, I have to report an irritating technical difficulty. Twice, while I was starting to color the fox, I had technical issues. Once, the footage didn't roll, so I didn't capture the coloring. And the second time, as soon as I got done with this part, my camera recording program glitched out on me. Not wanting to start all over again and not having time to do so, I instead am just going to walk you through what I did in that section. So in the fox, I'm going to use a regular orange color, and I'm going to lay a base tone. I'm using relatively light pressure, and I want to make marks that have a direction. The, the marks are approximating the look of fur. So I want the short individual strokes to have a logic of fur. They should be growing away from the skin. So we want to see marks that go down with the leg, that follow the long portion of the leg. We want to see marks that follow the long section of the body. We want to see marks that head away from the eyes. We want to have marks that reinforce the round curvature on the side of the snout. So we notice as I'm coloring in the body here that I'm using a lot of small marks that all head in one direction. I'm not using a zigzagging texture and that the direction changes based on what part of the body I'm coloring. I'm trying to approximate and show you the different directions that I might color it. And after that, I'm going to go in and I'm going to start to outline the major forms of this tree that the fox is sitting on or standing on. With that, I'm going to use a heavier pressure on the corner of my pencil for the outlines, both around the actual edge of the tree and around the edge of the branches and the roots. Then I'm going to use a larger, flatter section, and that's what you're seeing right now, to put a base tone in. I want a base tone of this nice brown everywhere. I want every part of the tree to have some kind of a base tone of brown. I also added in some lines, some darker, heavier pressure lines using a corner of my, pe of my colored pencil. And those build and reinforce a tree texture. I've also added a knot hole over here, which should be an ellipse, a couple of small curves that come off of that ellipse. I'm going to leave that ellipse white for now because eventually we're going to color that in black and dark gray. So I'm trying to put my light pressure everywhere in this tree. Then I'm going to come back down to where the roots are, and I'm going to draw in a few roots on the back side. Notice with these ones that I'm using only light pressure. I don't even have heavy pressure lines to outline them. Then I'm going to come back with my green colored pencil, and I'm going to start to make a grassy texture. This is going to be in front of the tree, and beside the little den where the fox pups live. Grass texture, like fur texture, follows a logic. Grass grows from the ground upward. Each mark should start low and go up. And I'm going to do this on the right-hand side the viewer's right-hand side of the little den as well.
Once I finish with the grass texture, I'm going to go in and color the stone. The stone is going to use a base color of a gray in a light pressure. I'm going to cover everything in a very consistent light color using a side to side stroke. Stones often have angles or jagged edges. So I'm going to include some lines which have a lot of corners to them and have those in a heavier pressure, which is going to add a nice texture effect for the stone. Then I'm going to put the base tones in beneath the tree where the cave and the fox kits are. I'm going to start that by outlining the eyes that I drew with a light yellow orange. I'm going to fill those in a heavy pressure all around the outside, trying to leave a little bit lighter pressure in the center of the eye if I can. They're small, so that can be hard. Then I'm going to go and outline the eyes on the little fox kit that we can see. After that, I'm going to start to put in a light pressure version of the black gradient that will fill this area later. Eventually, this will be a heavy pressure black up here, but we're going to use a medium at the darkest right now. We're going to fill right beneath the tree at first. What I recommend doing is shading part of the gradient down to the height of each eye outlining the eye in the appropriate value based on the point in the gradient where you are, and then filling in the rest of the space. So right now I've started defining the edge of the gradient, and you see that I'm carrying that in around the eye that I've already outlined. And now I'm outlining the other sets of eyes before I fill the area around them. This makes it a lot easier to know that your eyes won't have a weird black extra dark outline, but that they will also still show up and that you won't cover over them. Now gradient starts dark and gets lighter as it progresses. In this cave, we're really going to use two gradients in the end, a black one from the top up and a brown one from the bottom toward the top. So we'll have a blend of colors. For now, we're keeping a very light gray in the, in the bottom of this. And we're going to use that to outline and define the space around the fox kit. I'm going to darken up the bottom of that because I want the other foxes in deep enough shadow that I don't have to draw them at all. So I know it's going to have to be darker for a little while. Now here I switched the angle that I'm coloring at. I probably shouldn't have. It's not good etiquette. But because I'm being very consistent and I know that I'm covering over this section in at least two other colors, I can get away with it. And now we're done with the light pressure of everything. So we're going to go back and finish up the rest of this drawing. And the first step of that is to go into the trees in the background and darken those up. We're going to darken everything in the background so that we have some more contrast. Not a whole lot, but we're going to add some more tone everywhere. So part of that needs to be redefining and darkening the edges of the trees. I'm also going to be going in, adding some more of those darker lines that define the tree texture. And I'm going to use a medium pressure to fill all of the space of these trees. 
So you see me right now going in and drawing the lines individually around the trees, keeping the same branching shape, the same internal logic of the tree, and building a cool texture that adds to the effect. In this section, you will also see that I'm going to use a flatter surface of my colored pencil and a medium pressure to fill in all those gaps. Here I'm in the finishing stages, adding in the medium tone to all of these trees so that those dark pressure areas don't feel as out of place. Trying to get those to integrate a little bit better, but still having greater detail and contrast between those, those areas of heavy pressure and medium pressure in the nearer trees. The closer what that we are to the tree, the greater detail it should have. And after the trees are done, I'm going to add a couple more layers of color to the space between them, the background area. I'm going to start with a color probably a forest green color going horizontally or approximately that across the gray color that I already filled in that area. So I want to make sure that the marks of my color are going opposite the ones that I've already placed. And I'm using a very light pressure for a consistent fill. I'm going to go in afterward with at least one other color, two in some spots. So I'm making sure to darken this up and give a nice consistent kind of green. I'm using the same green here 
with a very f wide, flat surface that I use in the scumbling on the forest floor. And I, in a lot of places, I let that green be heavier at the top in the area where the foliage might be, and where there might be more green in the environment that might color that top part of the page a little bit greener. And now I'm going to add another color into the sky. And this is a golden color. This is the sort of idea of the light coming through the trees and tree branches, light coming down. So I'm using a vertical stroke here again. Now I recommend having more of this yellow toward the top of each bay and up in amongst the tree branches, but leaving a sort of halo around the bottom the bottom of each tree trunk, maybe the bottom third of the tree trunk, and a little bit above the horizon line. What this is going to approximate is the idea that the light is coming from above and through the trees, through tree limbs, and so it's going to be lighter higher up, and there's greater shadow and murk in the air as things are lower. So I'm going to go in with perhaps a black or a dark blue, and I'm going to fill in that halo space. Again, using a light pressure, but this is going to create an effect of a deeper, sort of a little bit of a spooky, darker space, which is more accurate for most kind of forests. Now I'm calling the background done and I'm moving on to the middle ground. With this, I'm going to add in first one other color and then a second color for three total colors into the scumbling on the forest floor. Because this area is a mixture of you know, tree branches, leaves, moss, small plants, different detritus and so forth, a variety of colors that are all natural and organic mixes really nicely. I like to use this kind of goldenrod as well as a dark sort of organic foresty blue in addition to the dark green that I've already added. Remember, our scumbling strokes should get smaller and tighter as we progress up the page. We want more space between them so that we can see each color and the way the colors mix more clearly in the foreground. As things get distant, they become more uniform. So we're using smaller, tighter circles up the page.
In this section, we're going to start to add in some of the soil that fell or that was kept in between the roots of this tree. So with that, we want to use kind of a scribbling color of a brown. We're using a medium pressure. We want to have this sort of fill most of the gap between the ends of each piece of the roots that we've already drawn. But we want to be able to add in some black later on, so don't color too heavily, otherwise it'll blend into the tree. And we want to have a distinct, different sort of texture than the tree, so make your marks go all around. I just, I just scribbled. Then I add in the black here into that same area using sort of a scumbly mark, hoping that it will blend with some of the brown that I've already got in there. And with this black, I'm using a lighter, you know, medium to light pressure, not too heavy, filling the whole area in. And as you can see, I interrupted my scumbling of that third color in the background and in the forest floor in the midground, I should say, because I wanted to be able to use that color effectively all around the tree trunk. So now I'm going to go in and finish scumbling that area. And now we're moving into the final coat on the fox as we approach the foreground, our middle and backgrounds both being finished. We're going to use our orange color again, this is a time freshly sharpened, using a fine point in heavy pressure to outline the edges of the creature. Notice that even on this final pass, I'm using the same sort of short directional strokes that I filled the color in with to define the edges of things. Strong lines will interrupt the texture if we don't reinforce the texture with them. So as I move away from the face on the cheek, the fur marks are moving out. As I head down the body, the fur head starts to head down as well. We're going to be adding in heavy pressure of this orange, but we don't need to fill the space completely. We're going to add at least two other colors in, a red orange and a yellow orange. In some spots, we'll add three colors in where we need some shadows. But notice that these heavy pressure marks are reinforcing, not covering over, but adding to the texture that I built up earlier. Now at the top of the fox's body, the fur to be heading backward, starting near the face and heading away from it. On the lower part of the fox's body, we want it to be starting to head down and starting to curve around the belly. Notice the angles of the fur on each leg, the forelegs and the back legs. Keep 
keeping the texture active along the tail, noticing that the fur should be heading in different angles on the top compared to the bottom of the tail, and that they should be switching over around the middle. When I'm sh coloring in the face of the fox, I want to color around the snout with short marks that define that curvature of that snout. Then I'm going to use my orange and I'm going to use heavy to medium heavy pressure to outline the edge of the fox kit on the bottom. I'm going to fill that fox in where it needs orange as well. Keeping in mind the bottom of the fox's face should be white and its paws will end up being black beneath there. Now I'm picking up my black colored pencil again, using a sharp point on it. And I'm outlining the bottom of the fox's paws in very dark and filling the paws pretty dark, but not as heavy pressure. I added a very heavy pressure little in front of the nose for that fox. And darken up a little bit on the inside of the ears. And then I'm going to shade in beneath the fox's chin. Notice that I leave a little bit of a white space there because the fox's jaws are both white and need that little spot of white. Otherwise, it's going to look funny. Beneath that, I put a darker shadow beneath them. Now I'm going to go into the fox on top, the big fox, and I'm going to add another color in the fur, keeping the same texture, the same direction, same mark, all that same stuff. This is a reddish orange, or just a deep red if you'd prefer. We like to have three tones in our fox or in most animals. We like to have its mid-tone, which for the fox was orange, but we also like to show a darker tone and a lighter tone that are both matched or complementary to it. So this dark red or red orange adds a, a color in the same color family as the orange, which helps to create a sense of depth to the fur. That's also why we choose another lighter orange color for the highlights in the fur as our final color for most of the fox anyway. Now we're going to come back into the bigger fox with the black. We're going to put shadows where the legs join to the body. And we're going to color the bottom of the fox's feet or its little black boots. Noticing that the foot kind of bumps out away from the leg at the very bottom. We're going to darken all four feet, although I think I only do two right now. and I'll come back to the other two in a moment. We're also going to darken up the tips of the ears and a little bit beneath the chest. But notice the feet have heavy, heavy pressure on them. But on the, the bottom part of the chest, we're looking at more of a medium or light pressure in the in the fur texture. And then I'm going to add 
some black curvy fur lines on the side of the snout and fill in the tip of the nose. Here I've filled in black heavy pressure on the top of each ear and a light, light pressure on the inside of each ear. And I'm going to use the sharpest point that I can. I take a moment to sharpen my pencil here and I'm going to trace over the outline above each eye and then below each eye as well. But I want these lines very sharp and crisp, so I really recommend sharpening your pencil to a good point before you do this. And on the eye that's on our right hand side, we only see part of that eye, so it's going to be partially cut off or overlapped by the snout. And then I'm going to also shade in with a light, light pressure of the black on the fox's chest for a shadow beneath its head. Now using my yellow orange, I'm going to fill in the eyes themselves. And I'm going to use the same color as the final layer of fur color and texture. So again, keeping the same texture, the same directional marks, trying to make sure that between my three colors, I've filled all of the space that needs to be the fox's orange body. Now I'm going to go in and darken up the fox's back feet, which again are a very heavy pressure in the body, medium to heavy pressure at least. And within the, the body of the leg. Then we're going to darken up the bottom of the belly with some medium to light pressure, air on the light side, just on the bottom showing the curvature. We're going to also add some of those lines on the very bottom of the tail. and we're Then we're going to add some of those shading lines on the bottom side of the tail as well. Making sure that we can see the fox colors between and beneath and through the black lines, but it's just adding a shadow to it. And now I'm calling the fox done. I'm going to go back down into the cave beneath it, darken up. First, I'm going to darken up the area right beneath the fox kit, or pup. Darkening the paws in the shadow as well, so it has a nice rich value to it. And then the shadow, or the the cave beneath it is going to be a nice medium gray. I'm going to make this now my final pass on this gradient. So I'm going to be using a heavy, heavy pressure to get a full black at the top, outlining underneath the tree, underneath the rock, and outlining the first few couple of eyes at least in this really dark, really heavy pressure black for a very dark, dark cave. And it's going to lighten up gradually to a medium dark down by the fox kit whose you know, tail and feet we can see. So again, I'm defining how dark I want things around the eyes. Then isolating the eyes and outlining them and then filling the space around.
Now remember, the reason that I'm leaving it as a gradient here, and it's getting lighter down toward the bottom, is so that I can put another gradient in opposite the black one. And with that, I'm going to use a brown. It's going to be full, heavy pressure on the bottom of the page and lighten up as it heads up toward the dark and the darkness of the cave. Now, after I take a moment to sharpen all my pencils, I'm going to go in and add the final layer in the tree. That's going to be a lot more lines using medium and heavy pressure between them, using sharper points of the tree to really build up layers of the texture. So here I'm using the point in heavy and medium pressure and faces or larger flat areas in a medium pressure to fill every part of this tree. Now I'm going to outline this knot hole. It should look like the start of a branch got cut off. The round, because it's at an angle, but it should look round to us like the spot where the branch got broken off has become elliptical. So I draw almost a football kind of shape with a couple of curves coming off of them. Darkening up and filling in all the rest of the tree. Now I'm adding in some heavy pressure. First, just some, some extra texture, but now also right beneath the fox to give the impression of a shadow. By using the same color as the rest of the tree, the fox's shadow feels integrated. Then I'm also going to darken up the bottom of the tree itself, partially with some extra dark pressure or extra heavy pressure of this brown. Later, I'll come back with some black as well. Here, I'm going to outline that knot hole really firmly and darken up the lines that come out of that. I'm also going to draw one line or two that curve around the front of that knot hole. So for each branch, the back side should generally be darker, or the bottom side should be darker. So we're adding in some of those shades right now. Now I'm going to fill in the knot hole with a bit of a gradient, but I want it to be black on the bottom and very dark gray above, but not quite fully black. So it looks sort of shadowy. And with that black still in hand, I'm going to go in and darken up those shadows where I've already darkened it somewhat with darker lines and extra 
heavy pressure of my browns, I'm going to reinforce some of those shadows, both in the branches and amongst the roots with some black. With this part, I'm using the black in mostly a light or medium light pressure, just to add a little bit of a tone. Now I'm going to draw the shadow of the tree on this rock that's holding it up. That should be the edge of which should be almost straight down to make this look like a deep, satisfactorily deep hole. And then I'm going to stipple on a few other colors, perhaps some gray, some different stony colors. I think that I might use some gold or some actual shining uh, silver color, perhaps brown, black, whatever colors you prefer. We're using a stippling texture for at least two or three colors. And then I'm going to go in with a dark gray and redraw the lines to add back a little bit of the sharp angular edgy texture that this rock has. After doing that, it seems like the shadow needs to be a little darker, both on top of, on the far side of, and right beneath the tree. So I darken that shadow up. I am adding the extra forest floor colors, that darker blue and the goldenrod yellow color that I added in, into the grass texture that we've already established.
our final steps for finishing this picture. First, I'm just going to define with a pencil and a regular drawing pencil and my orange colored pencil, redefine a little bit of the eyes and the important details of the fox kit, which are hard. And after that, I'm just going to dip one end of a cotton swab into oil, just a little bit, and I'm going to blend this whole cave so it's nice and dark. But I'm trying to keep the oil only lightly pressured, light amount of oil, and keeping it all within the cave area. Once you have that whole area nice and blended, you're done. Congratulations, you rock. I hope you feel really satisfied with this wonderful drawing. I hope that you learned a lot and had fun. Have a great day.